Chapter 32, The Politics of Boom and Bust, 1920-1932. So this is the big Great Depression chapter. It talks about the causes of the Great Depression, uh, the, the economic and foreign diplomatic developments of the 1920s and early 1930s. So in the aftermath of the Woodrow Wilson uh, debacle, uh, America votes in a series of Republican presidents. The first one is Warren G. Harding. He dies, and his vice president, Calvin Coolidge, uh, comes into office. And then in uh, 1928, another Republican by the name of Herbert Hoover is elected. So you get a series of three very pro-business, very conservative Republican presidents. And the, the policies that they set up uh, are very favorable uh, to, to corporations, uh, very favorable to uh protecting American industry, you see a series of high tariffs, and uh, it, it just goes, it's very anti-progressive era movement type stuff. So under Warren G. Harding, who by all accounts is an absolute idiot, guys from Ohio, um, antitrust laws that had been put in place by Teddy Roosevelt, Taft, and w Wilson uh, were either ignored, circumvented, or feebly enforced. Uh, the Interstate Commerce Commission, which you remember was, was created under the Interstate Commerce Act, uh, which was supposed to investigate unfair business practices, uh, was actually dominated by pro-business men. So it wasn't enforced at all. It was the, the, the veritable wolf guarding the hen house. Harding's administration is actually considered to be one of the most corrupt of all time. He, it's right up there with the Ulysses S. Grant uh, administration as far as all of the scandals that happened. And you can see there's a political cartoon from the book uh, that just shows how uh, various parts of Washington, D.C. were uh, sold. Meanwhile, Europe is still trying to fix itself in the, the aftermath of World War I, and they're seeking our aid. They're seeking either debt relief, because remember we loaned them billions of dollars during World War I, or they're seeking uh, additional aid. And we didn't. We We returned to our 19th century isolationist ways and not only did we not help Europe but we still were strict in demanding that our loans from World War One be repaid. So I told you about the tariff. Remember the last tariff we talked about uh, was the Underwood tariff. I believe that was passed during the Woodrow Wilson administration. We hike our tariff up higher than the Underwood tariff. It's basically because we were worried that Europe was going to flood uh, America with cheap European goods in the aftermath of World War One, as they tried to fix their economy and we wanted to protect American industry. So Congress passes the Fordney McCumber Tariff Law in 1922 and it boosts the tariff rates from 27% to 38.5%. So that's a that's about an 11% increase. Uh, it's not solely to to raise revenue because you remember now the American government is getting most of its revenue from income taxes. It's not from the sale of land or tariffs anymore. This is purely a protectionist measure trying to aid American businesses at the detriment to European businesses. This also sucks if you're an American because it means that uh, the price that you're paying for goods is artificially high. Now because the American economy is going so well at this time, uh, the American public didn't really feel this crunch. And as we talked about in the last chapter, uh, Americans were buying so many things on credit uh, that they, they didn't really feel like they needed to, to get the best international deal. This hurts Europe. Europe, look, they needed to make money. They needed to make profits so that they could repay us their war debt and so that they could rebuild their own fractured economies. And so they get really pissed off uh, when we jack up the tariff rates here by over 11 percent and so this uh, instigates them to pass their own tariff bills so American manufactured goods uh, aren't being sold at levels they probably would have been in Europe and even American agricultural goods aren't being sold the hell they were in uh, Europe so it's just it's a, it's unfortunate because it really puts a chilling effect on international trade all right I talked about the scandals Remember, there's about three big scandals in the Grant administration. There's about three big scandals in the Warren Harding administration also. The biggest one is called the Teapot Dome Scandal, and it involves uh, the sale of oil or the 
basically the well, the vials bribes. So the Secretary of the Interior was a corrupt dude. You don't need to know his name. He basically tricks um, the head of the Navy to transfer its strategic oil reserves in Teapot Dome, Wyoming, to him. His argument was, we're not at war. Uh, the, the oil is in Wyoming, which has no uh, oceans anywhere near it, so it should be within his purview right, as Secretary of the Interior. And then as soon as the Navy does so, he then accepts a bribe from a bunch of wealthy oilmen and leases this oil reserve to the oilmen. And of course, they then sell this oil at, and, and make profit off it to the American public. So it's a good old-fashioned kickback scheme by, by the government. In 1923, the head of the Veterans Bureau and others, uh, they skim just a small sum, $200 million, uh, off the top and put in their pockets in construction of uh, veterans' hospitals. So in the aftermath of World War One, we have all these injured vets, and we start building these VA hospitals um, to, to house them and care for them. And you know the federal government has to pay for the construction, upkeep, and maintenance of these hospitals, and that's what this guy's doing is just stealing off the top. Remember, this is the time period of prohibition, and there's always going to be exceptions and loopholes, whether it be religious or other uh, medicinal reasons for alcohol. And so in 1924, the Attorney General gets caught selling uh, pardons and liquor permits in relation to uh, prohibition. This is a political cartoon from your book. You also see this one all the time on AP tests, so make sure you understand what's going on here. It depicts the teapot dome oil scandal and how it's steamrolling all the way to the White House. And you would think with all these scandals that Warren G. Harding would have been uh, destroyed or tainted by all these scandals. And he probably would have been, except that most of these scandals come to light after his death. He's one of the presidents that dies in office. He travels, he, he goes to visit Alaska, and on his way back on the train, he gets pneumonia apparently, and he dies in San Francisco. And so he does, He dies basically before all these scandals catch up with him. And so who's his vice president? Calvin Coolidge. Good old silent Cal. This guy was a real uh, Christian fundamentalist weirdo. Uh, like the skinny dip in the Potomac River. Uh, just, just kind of a, an odd guy. And he was actually called, quote, the high priest of the great God business which gives you an idea what his uh, uh, motivations were in regards to uh, government intervention in big business. He was in favor of reducing taxes, and he was in favor of reducing the government's debt. So that, that's actually a good thing. Um, and he wanted to leave. He was, he was a big believer in laissez-faire economics, so the government should not intervene in business at all. Now, the economy in the United States during the Harding and Coolidge administrations is clicking on all cylinders. So it appeared in the 1920s that this plan of very low taxes, uh, reducing the debt, and laissez-faire economics is working. Right? We talked in the last chapter about this Mellon tax plan, and it's it's flooding America with liquid dollars. Right, and using this liquidity, rich people and the middle class are using this money to buy stuff and it's it's created that consumer culture that we talked about in the last chapter and they're they're investing right they're investing in real estate they're investing in the stock market the group that is not successful during this time period are the farmers in fact in, in reality the great depression it, it it starts with farmers and it starts several years uh, before 1929 when it hits the stock market it's basically the farmers' own fault. They were hurt by their own efficiency. They were making so much money during World War II feeding the, the, the war that commodity prices were so high that they purchased all these new tractors, new harvesting and seed equipment, and purchased more land. Of course, they don't pay full price for any of this, right? They, they buy all this stuff on credit where they have to make debt payments for all this because uh, they're trying to make more and more and more money. The problem is that in the aftermath of World War I, Europe goes back to farming. And so they don't need uh, all those American commodities anymore. And so the, the price 
of corn and wheat and soybeans, it plummets, despite the fact that, well, I guess because of the fact that Americans and now Europeans are creating so much. Because of the fall of uh, prices, because of the bigger harvests, farmers are unable to pay their loan payments. And so you start to see a lot of foreclosures and a lot of farmers that they can't even pay the taxes on their farms. And, and so you see a huge uptick actually in tenant farming. All right, international affairs. So this is all hinges on what happened in World War One. You remember that we loaned a ton of money uh, to the Allies, especially Britain and France. We talked about in the last chapter the J.P. Morgan's corporation itself loaned $2.3 billion uh, to Great Britain. When you tallied all the Allied war debts, they amount to approximately $10 billion, which back then that was a lot of money. The Britain and France didn't really want to pay back this money. Go figure. And they, they had two arguments. They argued that they did most of the fighting. Remember, America didn't even get involved until really 1917, whereas Britain and France were fighting in 1914. So they claimed that since they did most of the heavy lifting of the war, um, they shouldn't have to repay these debts. Uh, that they should basically be America's contribution to the war effort is just a donation of this money. They also claimed that it was impossible for them to repay these debts because of the 4D McCumber tariff. It was just too high, and they were unable to sell their goods in America, so they don't have money to repay the debt. America basically said, too bad. We want our money. So as a result, Britain and France, um, as part of the Versailles Treaty, had written in uh, a guilt clause, right? That's that Germany was at fault for the war. And so as a result, they pushed Germany to make reparation payments. In other words, punitive damages uh, to pay Britain and France. And this amounted to billions of dollars. And then, of course, the idea was that France and Britain would use these punitive damages to repay their war debts to the United States. Germany says, well, no, we're not going to do that because our economies hurt even worse than you. And, you know, there's, we're not the only ones that, that started this war. France, in response to this, sends its troops into Germany's industrialized Ruhr Valley in 1923. That's where most of the coal deposits and most of the big factories in Germany were located at. And they based, they operate like an occupying force until they got their payment. So Germany's like, well, France, you want your money? Here we go. I'll give it to you. And they just told uh, their mint to start printing money without any type of backing and just set the printing presses on high speed. So in other words, they print tons and tons of German money without anything to back it up and this causes not just inflation but something called hyperinflation you're going to see this is the kind of a graphic organizer of you know initially or actually how this is is solved at the end of the day so you can look at this now and we'll get back to this but wall street bankers make private loans to germany germany starts paying back uh, the reparations to Great Britain and France, who then make uh, their, their debt payments uh, back to the United States Treasury. So you can see we're the, the linchpin for this cycle here. But, as I was talking about hyperinflation, this is the aggression of value of the German money compared to U.S. money. So, starting in 1919, one German mark, I should say, I'm sorry, one U.S. dollar was worth 64 and change German marks, which was pretty bad, but that's the immediate aftermath of World War One. You can see once Germany sets the printing presses on high speed in 1923, it gets to the point where one U.S. dollar is worth what is that? Four trillion, two hundred billion, I think uh, German marks. So you can see that it, it gets absolutely this absolutely ridiculous. wipes out the life savings of virtually every German citizen uh, around. If you were an old person who had saved up, we'll say, a few hundred thousand German marks to live on, well, that's now worth less than a penny. So it completely wipes out anybody who's on a fixed income. So much so that you see these ridiculous photos that are true, uh, that in Germany this woman is actually burning money in her furnace because it was cheaper to heat her house 
burning money than it was to uh, uh, purchase coal with the money. Here are kids. Instead of playing with blocks in Germany, they're playing with giant stacks of million dollar bills. You can actually still obtain some of these uh, uh, just ridiculously high German marks on the internet, on eBay. They're like collector's items. They're not legal tender anymore, but you can still purchase them. This problem is is not unique to Germany. Uh, for the last several years, it's also been happening in a country in Africa called Zimbabwe. As the dictator there has tried to pay his soldiers and, and boost up his regime, uh, and he's got no money to do so, and nobody's giving him loans anymore, so he just keeps printing more and more and more money. And this is a picture from your book of a woman who's cooking, and it's she's heating the stove, of course, with giant German uh, dollars there. Who knows how high they are? They're probably hundred thousand million dollar bills, and she's just stuffing them in the stove to burn. So this is fixed, finally, by the United States in something called the Dawes Plan in 1924. And we've already looked at a similar graphic organizer. But under the Dawes Plan, it reschedules German payments. So they're not forgiven for their debt. It just postpones it. Their payments are, are required to be much lower. And it, also, as part of this, uh, Wall Street would make loans to Germany and stop this hyperinflation. Uh, basically... Germany had to restart their money supply. So they had to start from scratch. Everybody had to turn in their old, useless German marks. And they just printed up a totally different type of money. And it would only that's the only usable money from whatever date that they set. Of course, then France and Britain and other allied countries uh, would use those reparation payments then to pay back the United States. So that's the what's going on during the Calvin Coolidge administration. You can see not a whole lot going on. And he does not run for re-election in 1928. Uh, instead, they get Herbert Hoover, who was the big savior of the Belgians in uh, World War I. He was considered to be a very well-liked guy, uh, an economic genius, actually, uh, a logistical genius. And, and so he's you can see he wins. Uh, 83% of the electoral vote, and he becomes the president then in 1929. A little bit about the background of Herbert Hoover. He's got kind of a Carnegie-like story. Uh, he's a poor orphan. Ends up he's a child worker, child laborer, terrible conditions, working in the mining companies. Uh, ends up paying his way through Stanford and starts his own mining company and becomes a self-made millionaire. Because of this, you see why he engages in the types of economic philosophies that he does. He believes in isolationism. He believes in individualism. He believes in free government, or free enterprise and small government. Because he pulled himself up by his own bootstraps, so he expects other hardworking Americans to do so as well. This works when the economy is going well, but by no fault of his own, the Great Depression starts shortly after he becomes president. And then his responses to that you know, reflect a strategy that would work in a different time with different individuals. So he actually does try and help out farmers, remember, because they're, they're really being hurt hard in the 1920s. So if farmers are too efficient, if they're, purchase, or if they're manufacturing too uh, much food, how do you fix this? And so he sets up the Federal Farm Board, which lent money to different farm organizations, different co-ops and whatnot. And these co-ops would buy agricultural surpluses in an attempt to help suffering farmers because, remember, they're getting such low prices. This doesn't really work, though, because then they use those surpluses uh, and they sell them on the open market, usually overseas. So at the end of the day, they're not really doing a whole lot. They're keep, the price of the, the goods is still low because they're, it's still being purchased and sold and you're still having the same amount produced. You're going to see one of the New Deal uh, fixes to this is to actually destroy crops, to, to lower the, the agricultural output. This strategy doesn't lower the agricultural output, so it doesn't actually uh, increase the price of the commodities at all. The, that, that supply demand curve isn't offset at all by this federal farm bill. So that doesn't work. Another 
a huge mistake that the federal government does is they actually remember we had the Underwood tariff, which was at 27 percent. Then we go to the the Ford and McCumber tariff, which gets up to 38 and a half percent. And then in 1930, as like a panic uh, move to fix uh, the Great Depression, which had just started, uh, they passed the Hawley Smoot tariff. That actually raises rates from 38 and a half percent to nearly 60 percent. In other words, there is virtually no trade that is going to occur between the United States and the rest of the world. And then that's an awful move. So in their panic to protect American businesses, their panic where they thought they were going to protect American jobs, uh, now it's impossible to sell American goods anywhere else in the world. Because, of course, the rest of the world is going to set up these high tariffs as well. So the Great Depression. It starts on October 29th. Or, I'm sorry, well, it does start, the Black Tuesday is October 29th, but a a couple weeks earlier, um, Wall Street starts to get hit. And it really starts to get hit because banks in Britain start to raise their interest rates. They start to raise their interest rates because they realize that there's been an international credit bubble and too much of money is flowing around too easily. And they want to call in their loans and stop loaning out money in order to protect their own investments. And the best way to do that, as we talked about several chapters ago with the Federal Reserve, is to raise interest rates. So that's what they do. They raise interest rates and they start calling in loans. This causes the people in the know to start selling their stock because they know that anytime you raise interest rates, uh, you're decreasing the amount of of money uh, around in the economy at that time. And that's less money that can be used to purchase stock. So you're going to want to sell your stock uh, before it hits the rest of the public. So smart, rich people start selling their stock. Well, the bubble officially bursts then on October 29th, which is known as Black Tuesday, when over 16 million shares are sold. There would have been more shares sold, actually, but there wasn't enough people uh, to buy them because everybody wants to, to sell their stock. And if everybody wants to sell their stock... Nobody wants to buy it. And so you have to keep lowering and lowering and lowering the price. And sometimes it goes all the way to zero. Here's what the Dow Jones Industrial Average looked like. Nowadays, right, it's well over 16,000. But back then, it hit the the height of about, what is that, about 375 or so. And then you can see throughout the month of October, it, it starts to go down. And then it, it has its collapse then on October 29th, and it gets all the way down to 200. And you can see that that lingers well into 1930 and beyond. 1930, so within a year, over 4 million workers lost their jobs. By 1932, 6 million workers have lost their jobs. And it gets well over that. It gets even into the 9, 10, 12 million. Between 1929 and 1932, over 5,000 banks collapse. Now, how? Right. This is. Here's what happens with the rise of the interest rates, which causes a panic on Wall Street. Right. So everybody starts to sell their stock. This also causes banks to panic, and they call in all those margin loans. Remember, we talked about that last chapter. People then can't pay back the loans. They are forced to try and sell their stock. But remember, everybody now is trying to sell their stock, but nobody of any intelligence whatsoever are purchasing the stock yet. They're going to wait until it hits rock bottom. Now, because people cannot pay back their loans, this causes banks to collapse, right? A bank without any money is not a bank anymore. Now, people and businesses who had savings accounts and checking accounts at these banks when the bank goes bankrupt, they lose all of their, their money as well. Because businesses now, are not they lost their money in the banks, and they're losing short-term loans, and because their stock price is so low, they're forced oftentimes to, to shut their doors because nobody has money to purchase their products, or you know, there's only so many radios and vacuum cleaners and cars that can be produced. And so now, in, in a last-ditch effort to try and save their corporation, they're going to fire as many people as possible. And sometimes that means the entire company folds. Those unemployed workers are now unable to pay their mortgage payments. 
uh, on their houses and are unable to, to make their loan payments on their cars and their vacuums, which causes even more banks uh, to collapse. And so you can see how this cycle just keeps perpetuating. And, you know, people lose their life savings and they have no job and there's really no uh, strategy to, to fix this. So at its height in 1933, unemployment is approximately 25%. So that means that one in four Americans are out of work. What this chart doesn't show you, though, is partial employment. Because many, many uh, companies would bring in uh, two guys, right? And just a little anecdote. And say, look, we can't afford to pay both of you. So what, we could fire one of you, or you could both work for half pay. And so it, it's we don't really know what the percentage is. We think it's well over 50%. Of, of American workers um, either re had reduced payroll, uh, worked basically down to part-time, and again, if, if it's that, that means that you may not be able to feed your family, you're going to have a real hard time uh, paying back your loans and mortgages and stuff like that. And you can see this unemployment rate stays very, very high all the way really until World War I. I mean, currently, you know, at the the, the bad recession that America had between 2008 and really 2013, 2014, unemployment hovered around 8, 7 or 8 percent. So that gives you an idea of how much worse uh, the Great Depression was. So different charities, including actually Al Capone, uh, set up uh, soup lines, right, bread and soup lines. And you can see that you know people would just line up. And that might be the only meal that they got that day. Uh, and there was really nothing to do. You, you could wait out looking for a job, but there really were no jobs to get. So there was just so much misery and downtime, uh, really for years and years. This is probably one of the most famous pictures of the Great Depression. Uh, it talks about uh, the Ogies and the, the Okies and the Aggies. Uh, this woman, her husband... Uh, obviously lost his job or the farm or something like that, and then skipped town. Right? Unfortunately, a lot of fathers and husbands uh, left their families during this time period, and it leaves this woman with, with three small kids. And she ends up traveling with uh, thousands, hundreds of thousands of other people from Oklahoma, that region there. We're going to talk about the Dust Bowl in the next chapter. Uh, ends up traveling from Oklahoma and becomes a, a migrant worker, migrant farm worker in California. Now, along the way, she's not the only one doing this, right? There's a, a huge number of people who are just kind of wandering aimlessly around the country looking for, for work. And so towns, you know, you don't want these vagrants uh, going into your town. They have really nothing beneficial to offer. They're only going to you know, possibly steal um, or eat up what little supplies your your town has. And so lots of towns put up these types of signs really at the right at the entry to the town uh, to try and impress upon uh, the homeless to, to keep going. A lot of people who lost their homes, um, they just started squatting places. So they would go to different garbage dumps or city parks and scrounge up whatever type of scrap metal or wood cardboard that they could and create uh, like a little shanty, a little hut. I mean, we're really, this is almost like post-apocalyptic type stuff where, you know, we're moving into third world type dwellings. And so, you know, kind of sarcastically, they called these types of shacks Hoover Hotels. And if you had a city park where a bunch of people created a Hoover Hotel, uh, it would be called Hooverville. Or, you look at this picture, uh, it basically looks like modern-day Beverly. I believe this is Pappas' house right here. Yeah, he's probably back doing something he shouldn't be doing. All right, so what are the causes of the Great Depression? The U.S. ability to produce goods was much greater than its ability to consume them. We basically got too good at making stuff and growing stuff, and there wasn't enough people to buy that stuff. Uh, this is almost always one of the major causes of a financial panic, right? It's over-speculation of something. 
there was too much money. This is kind of a Zen type uh, argument, although your textbook talks about it as well. Too much money was in the hands of the wealthy and not enough in the middle or working class wages. So the, the wealthy, you know, they were able to weather the storm because they had savings that they could dip into, uh, whereas the middle and working class did not. Banks were too easy to lend money over expansion of credit, and because they were too easy to lend money, um, there was too much uh, debt that was amassed on an individual basis because everybody was purchasing their cars, homes, vacuum cleaners, and on credit. Europe ends up not paying us uh, that World War I debt, so those billions that, they, that we were owed, they never get to us. Uh, because of all these tariffs that were passed, you see a halting of really international trade that would have equated to more people purchasing American goods and maybe more people would have stayed employed and factories would have stayed open. And of course there's that drought, the, the Dust Bowl, that just it happens to coincide with the the hitting of the stock market in 1929. The drought hits in 1930 in uh, the kind of the southern Great Plains region there. Uh, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, uh, a little bit of Colorado there. We'll talk about that next chapter. And so that was the, the hair that breaks the camel's back for, for a lot of farmers, and they lose it. This is that same mother you can see here um, sitting in her Hoover Hotel uh, on the road to California. Don't they look happy? What was Hoover's response uh, to the Great Depression? Remember, he was a rugged individualist. Um, he was a self-made millionaire, and so he was against government handouts to individuals. What he wanted to do is something called trickle-down economics, later is called Reaganomics, and he tried to assist uh, the big dogs with the hope that the, the money would trickle down and help the individual workers. And so the government sets up the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, the RFC, 1932, and it basically provided loans, uh, government loans, to insurance companies, banks, agricultural organizations, railroads, and state and local governments. This is basically a government bailout. And this is, Obama did the exact same thing in 2008, and yet it, it doesn't work in 1932. And the hope is that it's going to save these big organizations, these big entities, and that they would then increase employment or at least not fire uh, people. It, it didn't work. It was probably too late. If they would have attempted it in 1929, 1930, perhaps they could have staved off the worst of the Great Depression, but it was a day late and a dollar short in 1932. Uh, one of the kind of social welfare pieces of legislation that Hoover and the government passed in 1932 was the North LaGuardia Anti-Injunction Act, though. And it outlawed yellow dog contracts, which said that the workers were forbidden to uh, form a union in a, a specific factory. It also stopped uh, federal courts from issuing injunctions to stop strikes, to stop boycotts, and to stop picketing. Hoover also, you know, we're going to talk next chapter of all the New Deal legislation, and a lot of it involves the federal government uh, basically hiring unemployed guys to build stuff. Right? Lots, of, lots of national parks and just libraries and stuff like that. Well, Hoover actually starts that, and there isn't a fancy uh, alphabet agency name like there are for, for the Roosevelt programs, but he does institute a bunch of public works projects, and the biggest one, the most well-known one, is the Hoover Dam. One of the last slides is uh, veterans of World War I uh, get pissed off, right? They're unemployed just like the rest of Americans during this time period, and they have a large voting block and they're able to use their influence in Congress to get past a, a bunch of bills, to give them bonuses, to give them loans, and stuff like that. And there was supposed to be a bonus paid to World War I vets in 1945. This is almost like an early form of a pension, if you want to think of it that way. And in 1932, they're out of work, and they want that 1945 bonus uh, payable immediately. So they march on Washington, D.C., and there's thousands of them who are just set up Basically, a Hooverville uh, on the ground, on the Washington grounds, and stuff like that. Look, they try to get rid of them. Eventually, uh, the federal government gets the police and the army, uh, led by General Douglas MacArthur, who becomes a hero in World War II, uh, to evict them with bayonets and tear gas and 
apparently there was like a little baby that was killed by tear gas. It just looks, it's a public relations nightmare for Hoover. It, it, it completely demolishes what any type, any type of favorable public opinion he had left. So he goes from being the darling of America in 1928. You saw how big of a victory he had and he was loved by everybody to he's almost universally despised by both parties in 1932. And really, by no fault of his own. He was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Lastly, this is a prelude to World War II. Uh, Japan decides to invade China in 1931. And they do so. They, they had built a railroad in Manchuria. Basically, it was their open-door policy as they are getting stuff from the interior of China, uh, put it on the railroad to a port, and then sent to, Ch to Japan, right? Well, they decide that's not good enough. They will just want to take over China completely. And so they, they come up with some BS excuse. Uh, they actually blow up their own railroad and then blame the Chinese for it. And then they invade Manchuria in 1931. And the rest of the world, which is gripped in the depths of the Great Depression, all they do is uh, shake their fists at Japan and say, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong, and then do nothing. And so this emboldens Japan to essentially take over the rest of Asia in the years to come. And the last slide of the lecture, you can see there uh, the 40 McCumber tariff law passed in 1922, the Teapot Dome scandal in 1923, along with Harding's death, uh, the Dawes Plan in 1924, you see Hoover's election in 1928, uh, the Agricultural Marketing Act sets up the Federal Fire Board in 1929. The Great Depression starts with the stock market crash in October of 1929, the Hawley Smoot Tariff, 1930, the invasion of Manchuria by Japan in 1931, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation is established in 1932, along with the Norris LaGuardia Anti Injunction Act, and the Bonus Army is dispersed by General MacArthur. That is it.